Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. In April of 2018, a new kind of tool for solving cold cases entered the public spotlight. It was called genetic genealogy, and it was used to help solve the infamous Golden State Killer case. Genetic genealogy works by combining DNA testing and profiling with traditional genealogical methods to establish biological relationships between individuals. For investigators, it meant being able to take an unknown DNA sample and trace it back to a suspect using their common ancestors. And with public DNA databases like GED Match becoming more and more popular in recent years, it meant that in some circumstances, law enforcement could tap databases previously unimaginable in size, without having to rely purely on their own combined DNA index system, which only obtained the DNA of people who had previously had interactions with the justice system. Though genetic genealogy as a forensic tool has become a subject of hot debate in the last few years, raising worthwhile questions about a citizen's right to privacy, there's no denying that it has become extremely useful in solving crimes, particularly decades-old cold cases like the Golden State Killer case. In fact, private laboratories like Paraben Nanolabs claim that they are currently helping police to crack these cases at an unprecedented rate of one per week. With that in mind, and in celebration of the year's end, we decided to devote today's video to taking a look at several cold cases that were solved in 2020, all of which owe some or most of their success to genetic genealogy techniques. Before we get to our list, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest videos. With that out of the way, here are five cold cases that were solved in 2020. On the morning of November 8, 1999, two Dover Elevator employees made a disturbing discovery while on a service call at Memorial Hospital in Colorado Springs, Colorado. When the workers entered the eighth floor to inspect an elevator shaft in a part of the building that was under construction, they encountered a foul smell coming from underneath one of the stairwells. When they investigated the odor, they saw what appeared to be the shape of a body, wrapped in plastic and bound with duct tape. They immediately went to police. It just so happened that investigators had been searching for a woman who had gone missing from Memorial Hospital just days earlier. A man named Michael Watkins had called police on November 6th after his 23-year-old wife Jennifer had failed to return from her shift at work. She had been employed at the hospital for just two weeks after being hired as a dietary aide. When police arrived at the stairwell where the workers had been, they discovered that they indeed had a body on their hands. It would later be determined that these were the remains of Jennifer Watkins. Jennifer had died as a result of blunt force trauma to the head. Semen found at the scene, as well as the position of her clothes, suggested that she had been the victim of a sexual assault before her death. Investigators naturally turned to Michael Watkins as their first suspect. However, they found him more than willing to cooperate with the investigation, and he submitted to several interviews. Eventually, police concluded that Michael was likely not involved in his wife's death, though this left them with no major suspects in the case. The investigation soon went cold and would stay that way for almost two decades. Beginning around 2017, new groundbreaking advances in DNA technology and techniques started to change the tools law enforcement had available to them. Among these was a process known as DNA phenotyping, the science of predicting a living organism's physical characteristics using only genetic information. Police reached out to a company called Paraben Nanolabs, who were able to develop a composite of the suspect, and concluded that the killer was likely a white male, around 25 years in age, with blue or green eyes. In 2019, police again utilized Paraben Nanolabs, this time submitting the semen found on Jennifer's pants for genetic genealogy research. This technique used DNA testing in combination with traditional genealogical research methods to trace an individual through their family tree. The analysis led them to a man named Ricky Sievert. Sievert was a 29-year-old maintenance worker at Memorial Hospital at the time of Jennifer's murder. He had been one of the people that police had initially interviewed about the killing, but had no real evidence tying him to the crime other than the fact that he had been working on the day that Jennifer disappeared. Unfortunately, Sievert had died in a car accident less than two years after the murder and could not be tested for DNA. However, surviving familial DNA testing concluded that he was almost certainly the culprit. 
From the semen sample collected, 99.99994% of the population could be excluded. Sievert could not. The findings were sent to the 4th Judicial Attorney's Office in October of 2020. When the review concluded in December, it was announced that the case would finally be closed and that Ricky Sievert had been the perpetrator. Police said that after 21 years, they were grateful to be able to give Jennifer's friends and family the answers they deserved. On the afternoon of February 5, 1974, five-year-old Siobhan McGinnis disappeared while walking home from a friend's house in Missoula, Montana. She had been just blocks away from where she lived in her north side neighborhood, a peaceful community where it was normal for children to be allowed out alone. However, with Siobhan's disappearance, the community's tranquil image was about to be forever changed. When Siobhan failed to return home that evening, search parties were quickly organized to scour the neighborhood. Hours passed with no sign of the missing girl. That would change just two days later when Siobhan's body was discovered roughly 10 miles away from her home in a snowy drain culvert near an exit on Interstate 90. The young girl's death was attributed to a combination of trauma to the head and stab wounds to the chest. She had also been sexually assaulted. The vicious crime shocked Missoula, and the police department worked tirelessly to try to locate the perpetrator. Unfortunately, they would ultimately come up short. Though the case would go cold for another four decades, investigators periodically worked the case throughout the years, following up leads, reviewing the evidence, and conducting interviews. As DNA technology became a standard part of police work, detectives were able to eliminate suspected individuals, but had no luck finding a match to evidence found at the crime scene. It would take even greater advances in DNA forensic techniques to finally crack the case. In early 2020, Missoula police teamed up with the FBI's top experts on DNA technology to see what could be done in the Siobhan McGinnis case. They in turn reached out to Authorminc, a private genomics laboratory in Texas that was able to produce a genealogical profile of the killer from evidence found at the crime scene. Using this profile, police were able to search for their killer in completely new ways, utilizing publicly available information from DNA services to establish the perpetrator's family tree. This was done in combination with traditional investigative techniques, which led police to a definitive suspect. In October of 2020, it was announced that Richard William Davis was Siobhan's killer. Not only had he been linked via the DNA evidence, but the vehicle he was driving at the time of the murder matched descriptions given by eyewitnesses. Davis was 32 at the time of the killing, and it was believed that he was simply traveling through Missoula when he committed the crime. Police could not determine what had brought him to Montana, though. Unfortunately, Davis died in Arkansas in 2012 and would not be able to face justice for his terrible crime. The news brought long overdue closure for Siobhan's family, who had been living with the mystery of what happened to her for 46 years. It was also a shock to the family of Richard Davis. Even after his death, his wife and four daughters had no idea he'd committed such a horrific crime. Despite the closure of the Siobhan McGinnis case, investigators believe that there may be more to uncover in Davis's dark past. According to the FBI, he has so far been linked to the attempted kidnapping of one other girl in 1973, and they continue to look for similar unsolved cases where Davis might have been the perpetrator. On November 22, 1984, 14-year-old Wendy Jerome of Rochester, New York, went to deliver a birthday card to a friend that lived nearby. It was Thanksgiving, and the teenager had a tight curfew. She was supposed to be home by 8 p.m., within an hour of when she left the house. When Wendy failed to return on time, her parents were extremely concerned. Sadly, it wouldn't take long for their worst fears to be confirmed. Just three hours later, her lifeless body was found behind a school just minutes from her home. Wendy had been raped and beaten to death. The vicious crime shocked the community, and police were determined to find the perpetrator. Unfortunately, the case would go cold, and their search would last for 36 years. It wasn't until the year 2000 that the next major development would happen in the investigation, when police submitted DNA evidence from the crime scene to the Combined DNA Index System, also known as CODIS. Unfortunately, the unknown suspect's DNA was not a match to anyone in the database. The case stagnated again until 2016, when investigators announced that they had found more items of potential evidence that could be tested with newer DNA technology. Among the techniques the police wanted to try was familial DNA testing, in an attempt to narrow down the potential suspects by finding relatives with common ancestry. This was initially rejected by the courts due to a lack of significant evidence, but by April of 2019, the request had been granted 
possibly due to the number of high-profile cases that had been solved using forensic genealogy by that time. The findings from this new DNA technique eventually led investigators to 56-year-old Timothy L. Williams of Melbourne, Florida. Williams was 20 at the time Wendy had been killed and had lived close to the Jerome family in Rochester, though it was believed that the two did not know each other. A DNA sample was obtained from Williams and was found to be a match to semen evidence found at the crime scene in 1984. In September of 2020, police announced that Williams had been arrested in connection with the Wendy Jerome case. Though the statute of limitations had expired on the rape charges, Williams was charged with second-degree murder. After almost four decades, the news came as a great relief to the Jerome family, particularly Wendy's mother, Marlene. Williams is currently awaiting extradition to New York, where he will stand trial for Wendy's murder. On the morning of March 9, 1970, two workers with the Colorado Department of Transportation made a terrible discovery near the Boulder and Jefferson County line. The body of a young woman had been dumped down the side of an embankment on Highway 128. She had been bound, sexually assaulted, strangled, and shot. The woman was identified as 23-year-old Betty Lee Jones, a newlywed mother of two who had married her husband Robert Jones just 10 days earlier. As police began to retrace Betty's steps, they learned that she had last been seen at approximately 3.30 the previous afternoon outside of her home in Denver. She and her husband had been arguing for several days, ultimately ending with Robert taking off in his car. Betty was seen trying to flag down cars outside their home shortly afterwards, possibly in an attempt to find Robert. Witnesses saw her climb into a blue sedan heading southbound, but had no idea where she had gone after that. Though police came up with a list of six suspects, including Robert and several of Betty's ex-boyfriends, there was nothing concrete to build their case on, and the investigation eventually went cold. Sadly, the truth about what happened to Betty that fateful day would not be known for more than 50 years. It took until 2006 for the investigation into Betty's murder to be renewed again in earnest. At that time, an unknown DNA sample collected from the crime scene was sent to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation to check it against the CODIS database. Unfortunately, there were no matches, though police were able to eliminate their original list of suspects. The big break in the case would ultimately come in 2018 when investigators learned about the forensic genealogy techniques used to catch the Golden State Killer. They decided to team up with a company called Bode Technologies to develop a genetic profile of the suspect based on the DNA evidence. The FBI's forensic genetic genealogy team was also enlisted to help develop a family tree based on the suspect's profile, using information on publicly available DNA websites. The genealogy techniques eventually led authorities to a husband and wife who had lived near Betty and Denver in the 1970s. The couple had two sons who would have been in their 20s when the murder took place. Though only one of the sons was still alive, he agreed to provide a DNA sample to police. He also mentioned he had a third brother named Paul who was estranged from the family, however he didn't know of his whereabouts. This third brother would turn out to be the perpetrator investigators were looking for. The sample that Paul's brother provided showed police that they were on the right track. His DNA was found to be a close match to the unknown suspects. After some more searching, authorities were finally able to track him down and learned his full name, Paul Leroy Martin. Martin had died in June of 2019, and his body had been buried at the Fort Logan National Cemetery in Denver. Though investigators were too late to arrest Martin, they still had time to prove their theory that he was Betty's killer, and in order to exhume Martin's body was granted in April of 2020. The resulting tests proved that his DNA was a match to the unknown DNA found at the crime scene. Martin had no known link to Betty and was not listed on any of the original police reports at the time of her murder. However, there was one final detail that seemed to further suggest he was the killer. In 1970, Martin drove a blue Plymouth Fury sedan. This was consistent with the witness accounts of the vehicle Betty was last seen in before her death. In May of 2020, the Boulder County Sheriff's Office announced that if he were alive today, Martin would have been charged by the District Attorney's Office with the murder of Betty Lee Jones. On October 3rd, 1984, nine-year-old Christine Jessup was left home alone in Queensville, Ontario. Her mother Janet and her older brother Kenny had gone to visit her father, who was serving time in jail but Janet felt that Christine was too young to be exposed to that kind of an environment. It would turn out to be a fateful decision. Christine had made plans to meet up with a friend at a nearby park that evening, but she never showed up. She was last seen buying gum at a local convenience store. The search for Christine would last nearly three months until her body was discovered in a rural part of Durham region, about 55 kilometers away from her home. The nine-year-old had been raped and stabbed to death. 
From the very beginning, the Jessup family was convinced that the perpetrator had to be someone that knew Christine, likely someone who knew that she would have been home alone that day. It didn't take long for both the family and investigators to narrow in on a suspect, Guy Paul Morin. Morin was a neighbor of the Jessup family, and Janet described him to police as a, quote, weird type of guy. Acting mainly on this character assessment of Morin, police arrested him in April of 1985. His trial began the following January. To Morin's defense team, it was clear that the case against him was full of holes. Prosecutors relied on the testimony of a known liar who claimed to have heard Morin's jailhouse confession. A police officer was charged after it was discovered that he had switched a cigarette butt found at the murder scene. To Morin's relief, after a month-long trial, he was acquitted. However, the province wasn't willing to accept this result. Certain that they had the right man, they appealed the decision and a retrial was ordered in June of 1987. This retrial was delayed for several years as Morin's legal team fought the decision, bringing further arguments about prosecutorial misconduct and violation of the double jeopardy rule. But by 1992, the second trial was set to go ahead. It would last for nine months, making it the longest murder trial in Canadian history at the time. The total of expenses and legal fees resulted in an estimated cost to taxpayers of approximately $11 million. However, the prosecution got what they wanted, and Morin was convicted of first-degree murder, receiving a life sentence. Throughout the entire ordeal, Morin continued to profess his innocence. He appealed his conviction, and finally in 1995, his case was set to appear in court. But before that could happen, an even luckier turn of events unfolded, when new DNA testing in the case excluded Morin as the perpetrator. His conviction was thrown out shortly after, and he would ultimately receive $1.25 million in compensation from the government. The findings also led to a judicial inquiry, where further evidence of police and prosecutorial misconduct was discovered. Wiretap and interrogation tapes had been lost or erased, potent exculpatory evidence had been misplaced or tainted, and forensic evidence had been misrepresented by the province at trial. However, Despite these important revelations and the vindication of an innocent man, investigators were no closer to discovering the identity of Christine Jessup's real killer. It wouldn't be until October of 2020 that the Jessup family would finally get some answers, when after nearly 36 years, Toronto police announced that they had found the culprit. The man's name was Calvin Hoover. It turned out that though the Jessups had been wrong about their intuitions about Morin, they had been right that the perpetrator knew Christine. Hoover's wife had been a co-worker of Christine's father, and the families had been friendly. The Jessup children and the Hoover children would often play together in their neighborhood. Police discovered Hoover was linked to the crime utilizing forensic genealogy techniques, taking their unknown DNA sample from the murder scene and using it to build out a family tree. Unfortunately, Hoover could never be made to face justice. He had committed suicide in 2015. However, Toronto police stressed that if he had been alive, he would have been arrested and charged with Christine Jessup's murder. Still, the discovery came as a relief to the Jessup family, who after decades of waiting and the added ordeal of a false conviction, could finally grieve properly for Christine's death. That brings us to the end of our list. Are there any other cases like this that you think we should cover in a future video? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest videos. Thank you for watching.